Welcome to the Stroke Buddies Tuesday Support Group Meeting. Today, we're lucky enough to have my friend and stroke buddy, William Lowe. He's presenting to us from the future because it's one o'clock in the morning on Wednesday for him in Australia. And William, we have to uh, thank you for uh, being willing to do this in the middle of the night and not interrupt our schedule, interrupt yours instead. That was uh, awful kind of you. And today, William's going to be giving us some information on um, how, to, how to use, how to create a blueprint for your brain, how to um, take the concept of neuroplasticity and apply it to your own recovery. So I'm not going to do his presentation. I'll let him do it. So William, uh, have at it and thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So welcome everyone to this uh, exclusive presentation called creating a blueprint for your brain this is a presentation which i've prepared tonight for ralph which is basically my my which is which is basically a presentation which i'll be doing where i'll be sharing everything i've learned through a ton of trial and error since i first had my stroke and i guess sharing things which i've discovered in my journey after stroke which i've noticed have worked really well versus others which haven't worked so well at all. This is a system which I discovered uh, when I was doing a ton of research as a occupational therapy student previously in the past, which I've 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 used with quite a lot of success with not just myself and my own recovery, but also helping other strokes fathers in theirs as well. Um, so, just a really brief intro of myself before we get started uh, about who I am and and I guess what what led me to 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 share this presentation with you guys today so uh like I mentioned I'm actually a um occupational therapy student formally uh I uh before I met Ralph I was actually studying to become an occupational therapist at university I got to my second last year of university and that was when I realized that a lot of the things which they were teaching me at university were very textbook and I had a choice to either work in the system, work in the hospital system, providing a textbook treatment to uh, stroke survivors or, or, and, and be happy with providing a textbook treatment, or I could either follow my heart and actually push, push the envelope and provide stroke survivors with something which could actually really help them. I found that a lot of the things which they taught me didn't resonate with what I personally experienced and I really want to help stroke survivors. Uh, so now what I do is I am a stroke survivor or stroke recovery coach, as some may call it, and I help stroke survivors around the world in their stroke recovery by teaching them how to modify their exercises so that they can continue to make progress and improvement in their, in their journeys after stroke um, even if they've been told otherwise, or even if they've run out of insurance and they're, they're kind of in that limbo period where they're wondering what they can do in order to get as much recovery as possible when they've been told that they, they've reached a standstill or when they've been told that, you know, recovery might have stopped. Um, I'm also the founder of WilliamLowStrokeCoach.com, which is my personal website, and also the founder of the Facebook Stroke Survivors Group, the Stroke Survivors community as well. So what are we going to be covering today? So we're going to be covering a lot today. Um, as Ralph mentioned, I'm going to be sharing how to how to take some of the concepts which Dr. which which Bruce covered in his lecture a couple of weeks ago and how to actually translate this to practical use in your recovery after stroke. And obviously a lot of this is a lot of translating the theory to practice. So we're going to be covering a lot of theory today. And we're also going, and I'm also going to be showing you how and why having this understanding of this theory or this 40,000 foot view of how things actually work can be used to help <coughs> serve you in your recovery after stroke. So we're going to be first covering how the brain learns new things after stroke. Um, and then secondly, we're also going to be doing a recap of what I believe are the five most effective keys to any exercise after stroke. Um, 
And then after that, I'm going to be going through some examples which I've discovered in which you can apply this to your own personal recovery. And I'll, and then after I've done that, I'll open up for questions. And a bonus for everyone who stays till the end of this presentation, I'm also doing a free giveaway on my website, which I will reveal at the end of this presentation. So first and foremost, before we get into it, I wanted to cover a lot of theory, like I mentioned, and go over how it is that our brain actually learns. And for some of you who, who saw my neuroplasticity uh, presentation in uh, Ralph's roadmap a couple of weeks ago, you may or may not recall that I talked about this idea of experience-dependent plasticity. So this is basically an, uh, the idea that your brain primarily learns from experience. In other words, whenever your brain experiences something, what happens is a, a blueprint of a blueprint is made in the brain of that experience made up of everything that, that the brain had to process during, during, during that experience. And this includes things such as movements, which you might have done before you had your stroke. So, for example, in your brain, there are, there are several blueprints which are specifically for, for your hand as well as specifically for your face. I... I call them blueprint, but if you want to, get, but if you want to get all scientific, um, they're also called cortical maps. I just call them blueprints because that's just a way for me to understand these things a lot better for myself personally. Um, and also, one more thing I should add is that the longevity of these cortical maps, all these blueprints, is highly dependent on the frequency in which you use particular movements and also how relevant or how important they are to you, um, which, is, which, is why, which is why you might recall that your brain tends to remember very important experiences in your life, such as, uh, I, guess, I guess, really traumatic experiences, such as car crashes, um, having, having your first kiss, and also other experiences which... which which your brain has identified as very important. So, so, so that's just something to really keep in mind when it comes to recovery after stroke is that your brain is a receiver of information in that it's constantly processing everything you do on a daily basis and it's taking notes on whether or not something is important enough for it to, to store in its long-term memory so that it can use it for later. Um, and... And just to give an example of this, uh, if if you think about blind people um, who 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 have to read Braille in order to understand what someone is saying, the part of their brain which is which is which is dedicated to their hand is hand and being able to feel things is massive compared to other parts of their brain, um, and the same goes for piano players as well because they use they use that part of their body so much. So, so now that we've covered that, uh, I just wanted to go through some of the thing which, things which Bruce might have covered in his uh, presentation a few weeks back. And based on, based on, the, um, based on what I've been told, uh, he covered something called the motor homunculus. Uh, and the motor homunculus is basically a way of identifying which parts of your brain are, are, responsible, are, are responsible for different parts of your body or, or the movements in which your body is. You know what? I might just try that again because it's one o'clock in the morning um, and, you know, I'm still not fresh out. Um, so I might just try that again. Um, because I'm not really happy with that explanation. So just bear with me. Just, I'll just give it one more go. <laughs> okay, so the motor homunculus is basically a way of interpreting which parts of your brain are responsible for, for the movements which your body is supposed to perform. Um, and basically, and basically the mo this, this, this motor homunculus came from from some scientists back in the 1900s who, who took the time to map out specific parts of the brain to see which parts 
correspond to which body parts. And these, in these, in these parts of the brain, which correspond to different parts of your body, these are, are called blueprints or cortical maps or also somatotopic maps, which is another word which is used to describe them. And when you look at somatotopic maps, soma actually means body. Soma actually is a, a word used to identify the body of a cell. Um, so when you look at that word, soma, somatotopic maps, that actually means body maps. So when you're interpreting the motor homunculus, what you're looking at is you're looking at a map of the body from the brain. And as you can see from this picture, we're taking a cross section of this part of the brain and then we're having a look at which, which, which parts of the body correspond to this cross section in the brain. So we can see that in this part of the brain, we can see that this, this part of the brain contains a blueprint for your face and this part of the brain contains a blueprint for your hand and so on and so forth. And here, when you take out that cross section, what you have here is you have a blueprint or a cortical map. And this is actually what it looks like. So, so when you look at this map or this blueprint, you can see that the colored areas actually correspond to different parts of your body. So the purple area, so this is the blueprint of your hand, I'm assuming. The purple area actually, actually corresponds to your pinky finger. The blue area corresponds to your ring finger. And then the green area corresponds to your middle. And the yellow area uh, cor corresponds to your index. And the red obviously corresponds with your thumb as well. So, and, and, and when you look at how all of this actually works together, you can see here in the brain, we can pretend that we can pretend that maybe this area is used for your hand and then next to it would be your face and so on and so forth. And for those of you who are interested in why, and why the area of your brain, which is responsible for your face, is right next to the area of your brain, which is responsible for your hand, it's because when we were babies, whenever you were a baby and you saw something, immediately what you would do is you would reach out for it. So that's why the area of the brain, which is dedicated to your face, is very close to the area of your brain, which is dedicated to your hand. I'm just going to have a look at my notes again to see, see if there's anything else. No, I didn't. So, so I just wanted to do a check-in. Um, can everyone just nod or give a thumbs up if that makes sense, or if this is you know too scientific, and it's like, whoa, this is this is too much. Got a lot of thumbs up. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, so, so these, um, so these blueprints basically rep represent. So, so these blueprints of your brain basically rep represent parts of your body. Um, and why is this important? Well, the reason why this is important is because these blueprints or these cortical maps or these somatotopic maps, whichever term you want to use. They're made up of the things which your brain had to process during its experience of doing exercises. And as I mentioned before, your brain primarily learns from experience. And because your brain contains all these blueprints of specific parts of your body, when you think about a blueprint for your hand, for, for, for hand movements, there's, there's a lot of things which have to go into that blueprint, such as uh, being having, having the ability to, uh, I guess, Few and diff, few and differentiate between different textures such as Velcro and um, carpet. Uh, I guess uh, plastic, plastic and cardboard, and so on and so forth. So, so when it comes to blueprints, what um, given given this knowledge, what what this is important because that means that if if we can create a blueprint which provides our brain with the components it would typically process before you had a stroke in order to, to build up that blueprint before, then what we can do is we can essentially be in a position to help our brain learn new skills and also recover things which it might've lost before, after the stroke a lot quicker than usual. And also, like I mentioned, actually, actually I think I said that point already. Learn, yeah, 
Okay, so 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 this is a double point. The longevity of cortical maps is dependent on frequency practice and for yeah. Yeah. So so the most important question is how can we replicate the same components of a blueprint of of the movements you used, you used to do before your stroke so that you can actually guide your brain in the right direction and teach teach your brain how to do some of the things you used to do before your stroke and allow it to learn things a lot quicker. And I just want to preface this with a really quick, quick example to frame this, that um, for any of you who might have remembered what it felt like to learn a bike for the very first time, you probably remember it was quite uh, difficult to really get your balance. So one thing you might have used is training wheels in order to give your brain a sense of what it felt like to actually balance. Um, I, just, I just wanted to put that in as a quick example of, I guess, a way of, a, a way how the training wheels actually help, helped your brain to create a blueprint of what it felt like to balance on a bike so that, so that you could ride it by yourself. So with that being said, I just wanted to really quickly recap what I believe are the five, five keys to an effective exercise and recovery after stroke. And these are things which I've discovered through a ton of trial and error, which, which exist in all exercises after stroke, which actually work. Um, so if you look at all the fancy gadgets and if you look at all the exercises and recovery after stroke right now, which actually work, all of these exercises, all of these exercises, they follow a, they, they, they contain five of these keys, and and usually one or two of them is 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 helping your brain to recover or learn how to do some of the things it might have lost lost after stroke. So, so the five keys to any effective after stroke for for any excess for any exercise to be effective after stroke is that. An exercise has to be challenging and repetitive. Um, that one's common sense, so I just put that as one point rather than two separate points. Um, an exercise has, has to be able to be modified. This is extremely important because if your brain just kept doing the exact same thing, then then you would just get to a point where 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 your brain just autopilots and there's no reason for it to recover more than it should. An exercise should also be rel related to the end goal which you're trying to achieve in other words an exercise has to be extremely specific and relevant to what you're trying to achieve if if an exercise doesn't doesn't give your brain a clear indication that 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 this is the way to go from a to b then it's more than likely that you're not allowing your brain to learn things as quickly as you could and Lastly, the most important one, any effective exercise and recovery after stroke must provide your brain with some sort of feedback or some sort of idea or clue that is doing things correctly or incorrectly. So this way, it can, it can allow your brain to have a sense that it's learning something the correct way. Very important. And if I were to look through all... All of these five keys, I would, I would, I would say that the ability of an exercise to be modified and also provide the brain with some sort of feedback, both of these are probably the most important ones. And the reason why most, 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 most recoveries or most stroke survivors find find that their recovery has come to a standstill in most cases because it's 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 because number is because the exercise hasn't been modified or the feedback that the exercise has been providing to your brain has just become so, so predictable that there's no reason for your brain to even pay attention to why it should learn how to do this particular exercise or movement a lot better than it already has. So with that being said, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be doing a deep dive and we're going to be focusing on applying this key, up, up, applying these five keys, which we now know, in all of this theory, which I've covered, in order to present to our brain the components it needs to create blueprints 
blueprints of the movements which it might have which it used before you had your stroke in order to do some of the things which you might have done before you had your stroke. But but before we get into it, there's 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 just a little bit more theory to go through, and I thought I would cover this because uh, because it's just important to keep in mind. So so how does your brain learn new things? Now, as we know, as 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 I covered, sorry, our brain primarily learns from experience, um, but there's also other things to keep in mind in addition to that, in that you are mainly a product of your environment in that in order for your brain to recover, like I mentioned, your brain is a receiver for information. So, so in order to give your brain a, a, a in environment conducive for learning, what you have to do is you have to be constantly providing your brain with new things to grasp onto so that it can tell itself that it needs to work a lot harder than it currently is in order to learn new things which are trying to teach it. Our brain is inherently lazy. So a brain left in stasis or a brain not presented with any, any, anything new, anything new or anything out of the ordinary is just going to stay, stay at a standstill and not going to work, work harder, harder than it should. And this is just another way of saying that, that you're going to have to really police your brain in order to help it learn to recover some of the things which it might have lost after stroke. And what this means is that you're going to have to provide high stimulation environments um, to your brain so that it can create these blueprints which it needs in order to perform some of the movements which it might have done or might have lost in your recovery after stroke. And as I mentioned, new imports create new outputs. So what this means is that when we're creating these blueprints for our brain in order to teach how to do some of the things which you might have lost since your stroke, in order to get past as a plateau or standstill, what we have to do is we have to constantly be presenting the brain with new ways of doing things and also associating these with new, with, with other things that might have used before you had a stroke in order to allow to learn things a lot quicker. And, and the reason why I say this is because, is because before your stroke, um, when we think about the blueprint, like I mentioned, these, these, the blueprints which were responsible for say the movement of your hand or your face, these, these, these blueprints, Quite, quite often they didn't operate on their own. They, they operated in conjunction with other blueprints at the same time in order to be effective. So um, let's, let's take the example of the blueprint for your hand. The blueprint for your hand, it doesn't just consist of your index finger, your middle, your ring and your pinky. It also, it also consists of, you know, the part of your brain which is responsible for, for identifying what it, what it feels to what it feels to um, touch touch something, or what it feels like to coordinate move movements movements in a certain manner, and that's and 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 that's why I want to quickly go over your five senses and why these are so important in recovery after stroke. So I, so as I mentioned, your brain is a receiver of information and it's constantly processing everything in its environment. Um, for example, what it can taste smell, feel, and see. And, and for, for those who, of you who are interested in the um, scientific or medical jargon for this, um, neurologists such as Bruce, they refer to this as afferent input. Um, and what this means is that because your brain is constantly processing everything in its environment, such as through, its, through, its, through the filter of its five senses, and um, modifying just one of these senses can make a huge difference in recovery in that it can help assist your brain in developing the blueprint of things it might have done before your stroke so that you can start to learn how to do some of the things which you might have lost since you had your stroke. 
and each can act as a reference point for how your brain learns and can either reinforce or impair learning. Quite often in recovery after stroke, if you're a stroke survivor and you've reached a point where you're noticing that recovery has isn't as noticeable as before, it's because it's because one of these it's it's because maybe um, like I mentioned earlier, um, one of the components of the five keys of the exercise have become a little bit too easy. Um, and but if you if if you're able to modify how the brain is able to process the exercise in a different way, what you can do is you can actually allow your brain to learn things a lot quicker. And you can do this by by modifying one of these senses. And and so, and so that's, and and so that's just really important to keep in mind. In that, a blueprint doesn't operate by itself, but rather before you had your stroke, the blueprints which were responsible for your hand or your face, they would also communicate with other blueprints which were responsible for processing your sense of taste, smell, or touch as well as your ability to see. Because by being able to communicate with your five senses, that's, that's, that's how you were able to do movements before you, you had your stroke. And, and I'd like to refer to this diagram again, um, because I feel like this is relevant, that, that, these, that these blueprints, they don't just operate on themselves. Um, you, you can imagine that there's another blueprint right next to it, which, which might be responsible for you know, your sense of touch, or as neurologists might call it, your somatosensory um, area. And, and these would communicate in conjunction with these blueprints for your hand or your face in order for you to do things which you might have done before your stroke. And if we can introduce this in recovery after stroke in an exercise regime, what we can do is we can promote a little bit more recovery. So that's basically what I'm getting at. And if, and if we can do this on a more consistent basis, what we can do is we can create a high, high stimulation environment which is conducive to learning and allow your brain to learn things a lot quicker and, and not experience and, and experience less, less parts of your recovery where you're not noticing that things aren't progressing as fast as usual. So, and I mean, I just want to add, I thought that this quote was really relevant um, for, for those of you who haven't heard of it before, it's actually a quote from Arist Aristotle. Um, so we are what we repeatedly do, um, which, which, which is basically another way of saying that um, if, you can, if you can do this frequently in your recovery after stroke and get to a point where it almost becomes second nature to, to modify one of modify your exercises and how your brain and and how your brain processes the experience of doing that exercise then you can keep recovery going as long as you want until you get to a point where you're satisfied and keep tinkering with or tweaking your brain until you're able to see improvements accordingly um, so 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 it's really all about um, test testing things and seeing how they Testing, testing exercises, tweaking, tweaking di di different senses, giving your brain the components it needs to build a blueprint, and seeing, seeing whether or not these 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 result in a tangible amount of recovery in in your journey after stroke. So I've got this guy underneath the brain just doing some tinkering. Um, I mean, I figured that was just a really relevant image for what I'm trying to convey through a screen during, during, during the middle of the night. So now that we've gone through, gone through a ton of theory, I just want to check in with everyone again. Is that, all, is that all making sense? Is that all making sense or is it a little bit confusing? I mean, I mean. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. It's very practical, William. I love how you're presenting this. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, I would like for you guys to excuse the constant ums and nerves. Um, it's one o'clock in the morning and my, my brain's not turned on as much, <laughs> but, but, I, but I'm glad to hear that, you know, this is, this is at least making sense for most of you um, because I'm, it makes sense in my head and I just want to make sure that the way that I'm communicating it, um, we're on the same page. So that sounds good. Um, let's, if, let's progress. If I could just Thanks. comment on two things, William. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, I'm glad you talked about the senses, but I think it's important to distinguish between taste and smell versus touch. Taste and smell are our two oldest senses. A touch is a much newer sense. If, for example, you touch something with your right hand, it's felt on the left side of your brain, in your left parietal lobe. In oh, yeah, contrast, of course, definitely. Um, in contrast, with smell, what goes up your right nostril stays on the right side of your brain. And what you taste on the left side of your tongue stays on the left side of your brain. So if you're talking about improvement of hand movement, for example, it's important to touch with your right hand. It's important to touch something with your right hand because your right hand is being controlled by the left side of your brain and it feels things on the left side of your brain. Taste and smell will really have no effect on your ability to use your right hand. Oh yeah, of course, definitely. I mean, I mean, I put those five senses there as an example, but uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Um, yeah, touch, touch definitely goes a long way in forming that blueprint or that cortical map, um, as I uh, as I mentioned. Could, could I mention one other thing? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I, of course, not a physical or occupational therapist, but the tools that a physical or occupational therapist will use to evaluate your recovery, for example, timing how long it takes you to stand up and walk 10 feet and sit down, can typically not distinguish between recovery versus compensation versus a combination of recovery and compensation. So you may get better at doing whatever the therapist is timing you for or, or evaluating that may not reflect your real recovery, but rather your brain's ability to compensate for your loss. I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. That's all right. Um, 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 you've, you've, you've brought up um, some really important points. Um, and I mean, at this junction, at this junction, I just want to mention that, uh, in recovery after stroke, there are two. Um, there are there are so there are I guess two ways your brain can recover. There's there's either compensation or there's another one called restitution of function, which is actual recovery. So compensation of recovery is basically using uh -huh. is is basically using enough to get by. Um, but the actual thing is the actual thing you want to aim for, which I'm assuming everyone wants to aim for, is restitution of function or actually being able to teach your brain how to do things using the affected side again. So everything I'm covering in this presentation, it's going to be focusing not on the compensation side, not on the things which are going to allow you to get to a discharge from hospital, from rehab hospital, for example, but the things which you can do in the long term, where maybe you're noticing that you're not seeing as many improvements as before, are things which you can do to encourage your brain to, to create real, real neuroplastic change and relearn how to do some of the things which it used to do before you had your stroke. So there's, there's, there's a big difference between compensation of function um, where, where you might be doing things in order to get by and just reach a certain benchmark versus real actual recovery, which is called rest, rest, restitution of function. But that's another, but that's another discussion, and that's like a four-hour one. 
I would I would presume. Okay, but anyway, I mean, I just want to cover that. Um, so let's so now let's just get into some examples of how to actually provide your brain with the components it needs in order to form a blueprint on the brain of how to do things it might have done before your stroke, um, and how to tweak these tweak these components in a way so that your brain has to pay attention, has to justify to itself that there's a reason that it has to work a lot harder to relearn how to do some of the things it used to do before you had your stroke. So the first example is, is um, first example of, is, is learning or teaching your brain how to balance, balance, balance on your two feet. So for those of you who might have tried this in your recovery after stroke, this is called walking in tandem. I think it's I, I think it's called a tandem stance. And basically it's a stance which requires a lot of balance. And, and what you can expect as a stroke survivor is that when you're doing this exercise, it might be challenging for the first, you know, for the first two or four weeks. Um, but eventually it's going to get to a point where where, where what your brain is interpreting almost becomes a little bit more pre predictable and, and maybe you're able to master it, but you don't know if you're able to master it because you're compensating by using your non-affected leg to do most of the balancing or, 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 or the exercise has just become a little bit too predictable and it's just become a little bit too easy. So what this means in these, in these situations is that the blueprint that your brain is creating in in your brain it's 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 not getting any more refined because because your brain has just gotten used to how it's processing the experience of how it initially did this exercise so one thing you could you could do to really teach your brain how to learn how to balance and focus on engaging all of the parts of the brain in order to to teach itself how to do something like it used to to before your stroke a lot better is you could you, you could actually tweak with one of the senses which your brain is processing or afferent input as Bruce might describe it as as uh, Bruce might might use to describe it to really wake up your brain and get it to pay attention and teach it how to to really engage different parts of the brain to teach itself how to do something like you used to before your stroke. So one thing you could do is you could actually challenge yourself. Um, and, and I encourage those of you who aren't very confident not to do this is to actually take away the ability for your brain to actually process sight and be able to see, see what's going on. And what this actually does is by closing your eyes, once you've gone to a point of balancing on your two feet, and it's become too easy. What you're doing is that you're actually giving your brain a new condition and a new way of processing the experience of performing an exercise, which which has gone to a point where it's become too easy, so that your brain can give itself a justifiable reason why it has to pay attention a lot more in order to teach itself how to do something it might have done before you had your stroke. And what happens when you close your eyes? Is that it? It forces your brain to engage other parts of your brain, which might not have been, might not have been used as much when you were just doing it, doing it with with the ability to see. Um, what closing your eyes does it actually forces your brain to engage your, I guess your vest, vest, vestibular system a lot more, which is basically your brain's brain's internal system of knowing how to balance itself, which is right in between here, between your ears. But by doing it in this manner, plus in the addition of the, of the challenge of the exercise itself, what you're doing is you're bringing an exercise which might have gotten to a point where it's gone a little bit too easy and you've, and you've, and you've raised the stakes so that your brain has to learn learn to work a lot harder to, to get to that next level of mastery where it's able to close its eyes and be able to still achieve the ideal outcome of being able to balance on both feet in this position. And this not only applies to this, 
to this exercise. It also applies to um, your sit to stand exercises or your squats when you get to a point where maybe you're feeling that it's a little bit too easy and you don't know that and, and you don't know whether or not you're actually doing the exercise well because you're compensating using the non-affected side instead of actually focusing on the affected side, which I just wanted to mention going back to my other slide, your brain is inherently lazy. So, so whenever, whenever your brain gets an opportunity to use the non-affected side to compensate an exercise, it will. But, but what you can do to prevent this from happening is you can actually put in conditions in place to force your brain to not use the, the um, non, non, non-affected side to cheat. And in other words, what you can do is you can, you can remove the amount of room for error for your brain to, for, for your, for your brain to make when it comes to XR of the stroke, which results in your brain being able to learn an extremely targeted and specific exercise, which engages parts of the brain, which you might not have engaged before, before when you were just doing this exercise in a very predictable environment where, you, where your brain was just processing the exact same thing over and over again. And it might've gone to a point where it's just gone on autopilot and it's just told itself that it's mastered as much as it already can from this exercise and there's nothing new to learn. So it can just cruise and just relax. So we don't want any relaxing. We want constant policing. And as you can see from this, we're adding the component of shutting, take, taking away one of the centers in order to, to, to force your brain to, to make this blueprint in the brain a lot more elaborate and a lot more refined. Now that you're performing this exercise un, under a different different environment or condition. So, so I thought that that's a really powerful example. I personally have tried this myself as well with other stroke survivors who I've coached as well, and they found success with that in their balance as well. So you can feel free to take that one and try that by yourself. Of course, exercise caution, as I wouldn't want anyone falling because of the, because of what I suggested. This is just, this is just an option you can use to, to give your brain an extra component in order to build that blueprint in your brain and make things a little bit more challenging and force, force the brain and force your brain to learn, to learn things, to learn things a lot more rather than, uh, I guess, being, being presented with the exact same thing. So, so the next example I wanted to cover are just some of the things I did are just some of the other things I've discovered. So this first one is actually an exercise I personally designed to teach the brain how to do, to uh, work on learning how to relax the fingers and actually close the fingers at the first time as at the same time, sorry. So as you can see here, this is, this is what, I, what I like to call the hole puncher exercise. And the reason why this is so effective is because with a hole puncher, what you can do is is you can actually position your fingers in a way in order to target the muscles which are primarily used to to extend your fingers as well as close them at the same time. So these muscles are called your lumbrical muscles and your your lumbrical muscles, they help your hand to go like this and that. And they assist your fingers in opening. They actually do a lot of the opening in conjunction with your other muscles which are used to extend your fingers which extend on your forearm which which is pretty much up here so that's so so the whole punch exercise as you can see it's just another it's it's just providing your brain with another reference point as i mentioned your brain needs several reference points in order to sort of form this blueprint of recovery after stroke of how it used to do things before your stroke um and, and by presenting your brain with a new different way of performing something which it might have already learned, what you can do is you can actually show your brain how to improve a lot further. And as we can see here with the hole puncher exercise, the, the, the good thing with the hole puncher is that it actually forces your fingers to open again. So it gives your brain that, that, that ability to see and also feel what it feel feel what it looks like 
to actually open up your fingers again after closing a grasp. And this one, this one might be suitable for people who are experiencing some spasticity. If you can get your fingers in a straightened position, like so, where you're just flexing up the fingertips, this one might be a good one for teaching your brain how to relax those fingers and train up those lumbricle muscles. Now, this one on the right is one I actually thought of the other day when I was falling asleep. This is, this is one of those wacky um, science, science gizmo or gadget things, um, which, is, which I think is called a Cartesian diver. It's basically where you get a bottle of water and then you put in like a little funny, funny buoyant toy thing and then you fill it up to the top. And what this does is that whenever you squeeze the bottle, the um, squid thing in the middle, the squid thing in the bottle, it goes up and then when you relax, it goes down. So this bottle exercise, um, it's, a, it's like I mentioned, it's called a Cartesian diver science experiment, I think. It gives your brain the components it needs to, to, to further refine that blueprint and teach your brain how to, and I guess give your brain a sense of what it, give your brain a sense that it's actually relaxing the fingers if you're in a situation where maybe you're experiencing a lot of tightness in your fingers and you might not be able to see your fingers actually relax because a lot of stroke survivors, and I know this just from talking to a lot of stroke survivors exchanging notes. Once they learn how to flex, they get to a point where they're flexing so much and it's hard to relax and it's hard to see any, any relaxing um, because of that tightness. But having this bottle, having this bottle and having this added feedback going back to the five keys of, Five, five keys which I described can actually give your brain a sense that yes, it is actually learning how to relax the grasp and it's progressing towards opening the fingers. So that's, so that's just another example, a really powerful one, I believe, which can be used in recovery after stroke. So these are just a couple of the things which I, which, 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 which I designed for for stroke survivors, which I coach one-on-one -on -one privately and which have allowed them to progress in their recovery after stroke as well. Um, and, and when you look at all of the fancy gadgets out there in the market, um, basically all of these fancy gadgets, they, they provide your brain with an alternative way of doing something to help refine that blueprint. But the difference is that you're paying $1,000 for them. Me personally, I prefer a more economical approach where, where I'm able to apply the theory and show you guys how to do it in this presentation as well, so that you can save a lot of money and not go through and not go through a bucket list of buying, you know, the next big thing and so on and so forth. Um, and I mean, I'll just go through another example. Um, anyone here ever heard of mirror box therapy? Yes. Yeah, so mirror box therapy um, is is a I wouldn't say it's a gadget on the market. Is a is is a thing in the stroke recovery market which you can buy, which I believe is is a really powerful advocate of this whole blueprint thing I'm I'm sharing with you guys. Because with mirror box therapy, what you're doing is you're tricking your brain into thinking that it's moving the affected the affected side by using your non-affected side to do that. And by doing this, what you're doing is you're actually providing your brain with a really strong reference point of what it felt like and looked like to move, to, to move, your, to move say, your hand before you had a stroke and teach you how to engage the parts of the brain in order to learn how to move your hand again like you used to before you had your stroke. So as you can see here, you've got a box here and you've got a mirror on the outside. Um, and what you're doing here is you're, by doing mirror box, what you're doing is you're helping your brain to refine that blueprint a lot more by engaging all of the sensors. Mirror box is actually a really, it's a really powerful one. It's a really powerful one because it's really intensive. And I believe that in the studies, you have, to, you have to do it for half an hour a day just looking at your hand in order for your brain to really engage, engage, engage all, 
all parts of the brain and build up that blueprint so that it's able to learn things a lot quicker. And I mean, if, and, and Mirrorbox isn't just the other example of this, um, other examples are electrical stimulation or functional electrical stimulation, which is something which I'm personally known for helping strokes while I was with. Um, the good thing about functional electrical stimulation is like Mirrorbox, it also gives your brain a sense of what it feels like and looks like to actually send signals to contract muscles like it used to before you had your stroke. So the good thing about electrical stimulation is not only can you see your fingers or your hand move as a result of the contraction of, of the electricity, but on top of that, you're also getting, you're also getting the added sense of the electricity, which is going through your hand and your forearm at the same time. So what, what's happening here is your brain is being presented with a, a exercise, which is engaging it on different senses on both what it's seeing as well as what it's feeling at the same time. And that's why electrical stimulation and the mirror box are so effective. And, and also I, I, I want to add another one. This is one I also personally designed where we're using electrical stimulation, but we're adding a ruler as a target or as a challenge to sort of give ourselves or give yourself to to try and move your thumb, say, an inch inch further away than before and so on and so forth. I mean, you can imagine how far you can go with that. But, but as you can see, with these examples which I've shown here, they're all engaging your brain by providing it with different components in order to further refine and build this blueprint which is created in the brain when it initially learned an exercise. All of these examples, they're they're taking your brain to a whole next level by, by showing it a different perspective of how to perform something it's already learnt rather than allowing your brain to stay stagnant um, when it just first learns how to do a skill. And it's encouraging your brain to, rather than compensate, develop some rest, restitution or develop some real neuroplastic change. So... Yeah. So, so, yeah, so that's, so, so is this all making sense for everyone? How, how the theory connects with the practice and so on and so forth? I just, I just want to do a really quick check-in at the moment. William, if I may, this is Dennis. I want to vouch for the mirror box concept. I've been doing it for the better part of a year. And I actually bought one I use at home that was very yeah. cheap and cost effective. I got it on Amazon for like $60 and I do it in outpatient therapy too. And I, to your point about timing, I try to do it for 20 minutes a day. And I think it's, it loosens up my hand tremendously. I mean, I haven't got the movement I expected out of it, but as far as reducing plasticity, it, it loosens up the hand big time. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I'm glad to hear that. Um, it just goes to show that that um, oh, I mean, obviously, if it's loosening up your hand, it's obviously driving a lot of change in your brain, and it's and it's forcing your brain, and it's, it's and it's and it's working because your brain is believing that you're moving your your affected hand, and it's sending those signals like it used to before you had you had your stroke and it's reinforcing how it sends those signals like before one thing i've noticed is that some people it um i've not done mirror box but um people will tell you it takes a long time you have to put in a fair amount of time in order to do it and some people tell you it didn't do anything for them and i think that those people uh, might be likely have not put in enough time Either. Oh yeah, of course. Well, I mean, I mean, there's, there's, there's no such thing as a one and done exercise. Um, <laughs> every, like everything has to be extremely targeted and specific. Um, I mean, I'll cover that in the next two slides um, because there is a caveat. There is a caveat to this, to this system, which I'm showing you in that it will work. It will work extremely well in specific situations 
but it's not something you can plug in into any situation and just find that you're able to find some recovery. Because quite often, you know, there is a little bit of um, unpredictability and recovery after stroke, some things you can't control. Um, but, but if you can act on the things you can control, then you can really go places. So, so I'm glad to hear that all of this is making sense for the majority of you. Um, just really quickly, I want to just go through the process in which your brain learns new skills and just provide a general timeline because I believe this is really important when it comes to, to applying this system in your recovery after stroke to really identify where you're at and whether or not you need to modify things or tweak or tweak your tweak your brain accordingly in order to see more improvements. So this is just a general timeline of how your brain learns skills. And, and the way I got this timeline is just by reading a ton of research articles, applying it to myself and just observing what happened. So what basically happens whenever your brain when whenever your brain does an exercise is it is it initially learns how to actually do the exercise so what happens in this stage is that it forms it forms a little bit of scaffolding for the blueprint the blueprint isn't developed just forms a little bit of scaffolding it learns it learns the movement which it's supposed to do in that exercise and it gets and it and it sort of gets used to it but it's still making some areas and it requires a lot of brain or mental effort. So this is really the beginning stages of when your brain learns how to do an exercise. And I would say that this is probably the first, this is probably the first two, two to three weeks, I would say. And after your brain has created that scaffolding and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, gotten to a, to a point where it's, where it's able to perform the movement a lot more, the movement actually becomes a lot more fluent in the consistency in, able, in which you're able to perform it, and it starts to require a little bit less brain. So this, this is sort of around the, the one to two month mark, depending on where you're at. Um, and this is, this is really the, um, this is, this is really the crossroads point where, where your brain either decides to stay, stay at a standstill, where it just maintains where it just maintains the movement which it's already developed and it just maintains that scaffolding of the blueprint and it doesn't develop it anymore. Or it, or it proceeds to improve a lot more. And this improvement happens when you apply this to real life or when you actually apply this system in your recovery after stroke and you start to modify or tweak things. And the gap between this and the application to real life requires a lot of tweaking and a lot of twisting. So once you get to this point where you're quite confident with the movement and it's quite consistent and it's quite fluent and you're testing the waters by testing in real life, this system comes into play because if you're testing something in real life and you find that maybe you can't open the fridge door or, or, or maybe you find that you can open the fridge door but you can't let go, then that's, then that's where this system comes into play in that you can go back to the drawing board and you can have a look at ways in which you can engage the brain to learn how to relax a grasp so that you can actually let go of the fridge door or the or the glass of water, as Ralph mentioned earlier before the presentation. So this is just the general process of how your brain learns new skills and, 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 and I believe it's just a good timeline to keep in mind to really assess, to really assess whenever you get to the point where maybe you're feeling that you're not seeing as many improvements as before. Um, what, what, what needs tweaking in order to provide your brain the components it needs to further refine a blueprint of how it's currently doing a movement and allow it to improve a lot further and regain more rest, more neuroplastic change or restitution of function as Bruce might, might use to describe to 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 describe this process as well. Um, now that being said, I just want to go through a caveat, like I mentioned earlier. There is a caveat, there is a caveat to this system which I'm showing you in this way of tweaking things. 
it only works best under certain conditions. Um, like I mentioned, there is no such thing as a one and done exercise. There's no such thing you can take. There's no magic pill. You can take like an Advil in order to cure a headache um, with stroke. Um, I wish there was, but unfortunately there isn't. Um, don't let anyone tell you otherwise that there is because there probably isn't. <laughs> yeah, so this system, it works best when you're noticing that improvements are a lot less noticeable in your recovery. In other words, you'll get to a point where some of my clients have described it as a standstill where they're noticing that they're not seeing as improvements as quickly as they used to before. Um, this usually happens when you run out of insurance and you've run out of therapy or maybe an exercise has just become a little bit too easy for your brain or too predictable for your brain. Number two, it works best when you have removed or mitigated anything which actually might be stopping you from stopping you from recovery, for, for example, spasticity or muscle tightness. Like I mentioned earlier, muscle tightness can, sometimes it can get to, it, it, it can actually hide, it can actually hide movements which your brain actually has, and you might be giving yourself a little less credit than you deserve. So quite often with people who are able to flex their fingers, flex their fingers, that might be because of muscle tightness, they actually might be able to relax, but you can't see it because there's that muscle tightness covering it up. So this system works best when you might have removed anything which might be stopping your stopping you from seeing recovery. For example, spasticity. So if mm. if you're about to go get Botox injections to help relieve muscle spasticity or muscle tightness, this system is something which you could use after you get the injections to really to really help your brain learn how to do things and expose it to your conditions where it's able to do things without that spasticity holding it back. And lastly, this, this, this system, as I mentioned, it works when an exercise is extremely targeted and specific to what you are trying to achieve. So so why is, why is everything in this presentation important? And why did I wake up? And why did I wake up in the middle of the night in order to share this with you? Well, first and foremost, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, aside from Ralph roping me in. Okay. So first and foremost, um, every exercise has an expiry date. Um, as I mentioned before, there is, there, is, there is a crossroads which you reach with every exercise where your brain can either decide to stay with, with the with with the current level which it's achieved, with how much movement it's and recovery it's able to get out of a specific specific exercise, or it can continue to improve and build on that blueprint or scaffolding which you've developed in your brain. Number two, um, recovery is going to be very difficult unless you like spending a lot of money on the next big thing or fancy gadget and newsflash there's no such thing as the next big thing or the next fancy gadget which is going to do it for your recovery after stroke there's no such thing i wish there was a silver i wish there was a magic pill which you could swallow in order to help you do that but unfortunately there's none um i mean i would i would assume that everyone on this call is in agreement with the fact that there's no such thing as a magic fix as much as you would like to believe that there is. Number three, um, application is really the own measure of recovery. Um, so, so in your recovery, you can either aim for compensation, getting by with whatever movements you've already got, and 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 compensating, compensating with your non-affected side to do things and and live your life the way you want. Or there's restitution of function or real neuroplastic change or real recovery after stroke, which happens when you actually apply what your brain has learned and you're constantly tweaking things in a way in order to refine this blueprint to help your brain learn how to refine movements it might have learned after stroke and perform these at a higher level until you get as close as possible before you had your stroke. Um, number four, new inputs create new outputs. As I mentioned earlier, our brain is inherently lazy um, and you are a product of your environment. So if you keep feeding it 
the exact same exercise, the exact same experiences, um, don't expect your brain to improve any further from that unless, unless you in, introduce something new to that. Um, and finally, um, like I said with the second last point, being able to provide a dynamic in the changing environment through the exercises which you're doing or through the experiences which your brain processes on a daily basis is paramount to recovery um, because, you're big, 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 because you're keeping things challenging for the brain. You're not allowing it to relax. You're, you're constantly guiding in the right direction. Your, your, your brain already has its own a, a agenda for, for recovery after stroke, and that's using the non-affected side to do everything after stroke. So you can either go with the brain's agenda or you can either go with policing your brain into the right direction to doing things, to learning how to do things like you used to before you had your stroke. Um, so that's so that's basically why why I've gotten up in the morning to share this, um, not just because I'm passionate about this, but also because I believe it's extremely beneficial for all stroke survivors in their journey after stroke, particularly those which I personally help one on one who have reached a point where they're frustrated, um, they've they've run out of insurance. They're not seeing any more improvements and they're looking for another perspective or another way to do things without spending thousands of dollars on a fancy gadget in the hopes that it might fix things um, in order to get a lot more recovery after stroke. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's everything I have to tell them. Um, and also the special bonus, which I promised at the very beginning of this Um so I created a free stroke recovery guide and I would like to invite everyone to um, get one. You can download one for free on my website. I thought that it might be useful to include this because it's, 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 it's a supplement to everything I've covered in this presentation in that it will allow, it, it, it covers more things to keep in mind as you're applying this system. So you can have a look at what you're currently doing and how you can tweak it a lot better in order to experience more recovery after stroke. So you can download your free stroke recovery guide at my website, willemlowstrokecoach.com or, 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 or you have to do is just share your email and I'll send it directly to you. Um, you can download it straight away. It's an ebook. It's an ebook PDF thing as well. Um, so with that being said, um, let's open up for a question that I, I believe it's two o'clock. I've gone over the hour. I'm sorry, Ralph. Oh, it's okay. Why don't you unshare the screen once everybody? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then okay. We'll see you bigger or everyone bigger. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, um, seems like there are things that you can do um, to challenge your brain to keep your recovery going and that they can, um, that you can use some of your other senses, either introducing them or taking them away to facilitate that, um, making it more difficult or allowing you to focus more on what you're trying to teach your brain. Um, anybody out there got any questions or Dr. Hetzler, you got anything to add? Well, I've got a comment. Uh, it's about uh, what William said in terms of uh, there's no new big expensive fancy thing that will help you I would have to both agree and disagree with that that is I agree that you shouldn't spend a lot of money but there might be something new that will help you now I'm referring in that regard to some old research that was done in the 1950s with laboratory rats. And there were two groups of rats. One group was raised in what was called an enriched environment. The other group was raised in what was called an impoverished environment. In the impoverished environment, the rats were raised individually in a single plastic cage with bedding on the bottom and food and water. In the enriched environment, the rats were raised in uh, what you might call a rat Disneyland. That is, there were tubes for them to run through, 
blocks that they could stack, um, other things they could gnaw on, uh, wheels that they could turn. And after being raised in the enriched versus impoverished environments, those rats that were raised in the enriched environment had a thicker cerebral cortex and they were better able to learn things. So now how do you relate that to uh, recovery from stroke? Well, if there's some new gadget and again, not expensive, or actually I like the, uh, the paper punch idea that William had. I thought that was a great idea. I'll have to try oh, that thanks. myself. No one, no one, no one steal that. That's 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 mine. I made that one. <laughs> right. Well, I won't try to sell it. I just want to use it myself. But that was a great yeah, idea. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can use it. I'm giving you permission to use it um, because I know. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the point is that a great part? Just just having a new tool to work with might help you get over the hump or or get beyond the so-called plateau, and even if thing like the paper punch might do it or uh, squeezing a ball and dropping it, whatever. The point is something new might tell your brain, hey, that's cool. I haven't tried that before. I'm not saying I have to spend $1,000. You might spend a dime on it or something. That might help. I'll be quiet. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I like what you said about enriched environments. I... I, pro I probably used a different term. I said high, high stimulation environments, mm. although I used enriched environments as well. Um, but yeah, this, this system, the exercise, the, the exercise provides a enriched environment for your brain to learn because it's so challenging and it helps provide a different perspective. That's, that's what the system is about. Well, one thing about the paper punch is it has a spring um, it was a static and uh, still shot instead of a demo. So if you close it, then when you stop applying the pressure to hold it closed, it's going to open your fingers back up. And this is a big thing of mine. I just, uh, I actually did a post on some grabbers that um, have are also spring loaded like the uh, three hole punch. Um, because when you squeeze putty, when you're done, now you got a fist. And you have to you have to learn how to open those muscles. And the paper punch and uh, a, gri a gripper with a spring will open them. And you can learn; it'll actually force you to open them. And you can learn to slow it down. And uh, we all know it's all about the controlled down or the controlled release. If you want to be able to release that glass, you have to be able to do it in a controlled way, not being not the two things that happen first is you can't let go of it. And then once you get some function, like I trained my, somebody said something about they were, did they use something regularly? I use the mail and I would hold on to the mail. And sometimes after I learned to um, relax some, I wouldn't be realizing I'm relaxing. I drop the mail on the way back from the mailbox. So that the, the two way spring thing really, helps with that hand opening, I think. And any occupational therapist, including William, will tell you, work on extension once you can grip. You don't want to just keep gripping and tightening because that's working against extension. And, you know, one thing about all of this is um, don't think of it as like, you know, a water bottle and um, a three-hole punch and stuff. Those are examples. This is something that you can you you can apply to any type of thing. I think the keys I found is to good stroke recovery are people that are paying attention to what they're doing and are able to get that feedback, realize what it means, and then figure out what to do and how to adapt. If you're an adapter, you're way ahead of the game. If you're a kind of a somebody who pays a lot of attention. Uh, to things, I think that gives you a better sense of um, self and body awareness. But uh, listening to your body is a critical thing to stroke recovery. So if you can, if you, and I think you can develop those abilities. So if you can develop those abilities, this system is uh, applicable across any number of um, 
of things. We, you know, we didn't talk about legs, but it certainly works there. And one thing about the devices is, you know, I agree with what um, William said and Dr. Hetzler said. You know, I use chip clips and things around the house like William was um, talking about. And the other thing is, you know, if you get a, um, I think there might be some future in robotics. It's in its infancy now. I'm actually going to talk to somebody about possibly doing a presentation on robotics. Um, but if you get some kind of a glove or arm mover or something, it's focusing on that one issue. If you learn this system and, and paying attention to your, to what you're doing and what you, whether you're learning or not, what's going on in your body and your brain, and you learn how to adapt and apply this kind of system, it's applicable across all, all types of recovery and not just moving that arm or whatever the robotics are, are, are doing. So anybody else got any more questions? No, but I'd like to thank William a lot. I really appreciate the talk. I thought it was excellent. Thank you for getting up in the middle of the night. I'd like to second that and uh, maybe let you go back to bed. Ken is sticking his thumb up and uh, Julie's clapping. So, and there's David Lauderdale. Hey, David. And David gave a thumbs up. So, now, William, I'd like to say that this was probably one of the most beneficial meetings that we've had. It's very practical. I like how you present it, very, very down layman's terms and very understandable. So thank you, William, for getting up. And my only question is, if we want to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, do we have to come to Australia? Uh, no, no. So you can offer. So I offer a free session because um, I feel like everyone deserves one. Um, on my website, you can actually book a free session with me. Um, and, and I'll link up across time zones. I, um, I'm a time traveler because I'm in Australia, right? Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I mean, if you're in the States, I know all of the time zones, um, Eastern Pacific, um, Central, Mountain Time, um, if you want to include that. No offense to people who live in Mountain Time. Um, but yeah, um, you can you can book in a free session at my website. You can pick a time and day which works for you, and it will automatically sync up with Australia time here in the future. Um, and then I can, <laughs> and I mean, I'll and I'll be happy to to give you a free session um, to to give you a free session. And if it happens to be a good fit, um, then I'll make some suggestions about what to do in the next step forward, whether we work together, um, and. And, and how else I might be able to help you. Um, you do a lot of that through Zoom, don't you, William? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do them through Zoom or Facebook as well. Um, some of them, my other clients, we do it through Facebook because they're on Facebook all the time. Um, Facebook has Facebook video. Um, so you can also contact me through Facebook, through direct message as well, which whichever avenue is more convenient. The point is, Dennis, you know, like when we do roadmaps, sometimes William will pick up something and draw on it and show it to, you know, to the camera and that kind of thing. So there's, you know, some interactivity and yeah, yeah, of course. That, um, that can go on. Well, just trying to make yes. it perfectly clear for you there, William. William, well, can, can you recommend you very much? Can you <laughs> recommend a source for? stress someone who has studied stress in experiential learning conditions a lot of a lot i do i work with managers a lot on managers and stress but not learning new tools new skills new approaches the stress and application of that and i understood your field focuses on the stress of experiential learning, which is something OD and academics do not do, that I know of anyway. Uh, well, um, well, well, what I covered in this presentation was, was really my interpretation of, you know, summarizing, you know, thousands of research articles and creating a system which worked for myself as well as other people. Um, mm -hmm. 
in in regards to your question about stress, um, Bruce, you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, well, he might be able to do it a lot better than me. In terms of stress, uh, there is a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Repeat, please, why zebras? Why zebras don't get ulcers. I might read that as well. And I can't remember the title of it, but it okay. is about the effects of stress on the body. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't remember the author. Um, again, why zebras don't get ulcers. And that will tell you a lot about stress. I don't know if that's really the information you're looking for, mm -hmm. but you can learn a lot about stress there. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, I Thank guess we, maybe we should let William uh, go back to bed. Um, I want to well, thank I you. Mean, I'm happy to stay a couple more minutes. Um, okay. I mean, well, I'm, anybody's got I'm awake now if anyone has any questions. Um. Hey, the author of that book, uh, I just Googled it. Bruce is uh, Robert Sp Spot Podolsky. Uh, I'm butchering the last name. Mm -hmm. S A Zapowski, maybe Zapowski. Yeah. Zapowski. Yes. Yeah, Robert Zapowski. He gave a talk here at Lawrence University several years ago, and oh. it's really he's he's a very smart guy, um, and it's an excellent book. But again, that might not be what you're looking for. But if you want to learn about stress, read that book. Okay. All right. Well, I think William, I think you get to go back to bed. And Thank you. We really appreciate you um, giving this presentation. I think it, like I said, in what I wrote um, in promoting it, I thought I, I think it dovetails well with Dr. Hetzler's and uh, presentations and and the theory because you know there's always a, a practical side to. Uh, applying any 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 theory uh, particularly to your case and as we all know every stroke survivors every stroke is different so every stroke survivors recovery is different so i think it's important to teach some um, systems like like this um it's what i always try and do rather than one specific exercise well yeah you can make specific recommendations but if you teach somebody a, a system a way to think, a way to pay attention to their body, a way to change things, a way to understand what to do with feedback. It's kind of like the, you can give a man a fish or you can teach a man to fish um, kind of thing. When you're handing out exercises, you're handing out fish. And this is more of a um, teach us all to fish um, exercise. So thank you for that. Yeah, and um, can I just add one more thing, Ralph? Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, first and foremost, I just want to act, I I just want to act, acknowledge Ralph for really setting this up and what he's really done with the Stroke Buddies group. Um, like, like I met Ralph, I think it was two years ago, and just watching watching what you've done for the community and Stroke survivors around the world, I think it's 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 just extremely beneficial to everyone who's going through recovery after stroke. Um, and with with regards to what I covered in this presentation and what Bruce covered. We've, we've sort of provided you guys with the 40,000 foot view of what's really going on. Um, but the next step is being able to translate, switch between the 40,000 foot view to, to what you're doing right now and be able to apply all this at a, at a practical level. Um, and I mean, it does require a lot of lateral thinking, a lot of creativity, a lot of thinking out of the box, as you can see. Um, but once... This becomes second nature. It's second nature for me because I've been doing it for a long time and it's what I do every single day. Um, it can really help you go places with, with your recovery, I believe. Good stuff. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah, thank you for the kind words, William. But, you know, I, I keep raising the bar. I guess I can keep raising it. We got some good guests coming up. Don't have anything much next week, but they've 
five other um, presentations lined up um, after that. We've got uh, Dennis, you'll love this one. Well, you found her. Uh, Dr. Marler, is going to, who's a physician who had a stroke, is going to give us a presentation on getting the most out of your physician-patient relationship. That should be real interesting. We've got Dr. Hetzler coming back twice. He apparently dropped out for lunch. Um, he's going to give one on the overview, uh, stroke overview, and one on the um, language centers. And let's see, we've also got a physical therapist who had a stroke. Um, like you, William, he had, a, he had a stroke actually younger. William was 16, I believe, I think. Um, I, was, I was 17. 17, I'm sorry. I'll memorize that. 17, Mitchell was um, six, and he ended up studying to be a physical therapist and is a practicing physical therapist. So that should certainly be interesting. Um, all of them are. Um, I think we're on to something here when, you know, Dennis knows about this. When we used to talk, we were, we were talking on certain subjects and it was good, but we've kind of switched to a more of a presentation and a scientific based, uh, you know, what does the science say and how do you use that in your recovery? Because otherwise you're, you know, you're spinning your wheels if you're not, uh, if you're not doing effective things and applying, um, scientific techniques and principles to, uh, to your recovery. So that's what, uh, that's been my focus and that's what I'm trying to do here. And, uh, the universe has been cooperating and uh, uh, by presenting various people uh, in my path and I'm just trying to do my part, which is um, recognize them, jump on them and turn them into um, meetings that we can all benefit from. So thanks for the kind words. And uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do next week. Um, I may announce a, a, a buy. Uh, uh, we're not going to do anything. Actually, what I should do is get a half a dozen people here to come and not really have a meeting about anything, but practice all the Zoom settings and switching and recording and everything because I really want to get that down. And I'm, I'm video TD, so when things don't go the way they're supposed to, you know, I know I'm not going to get fired because I'm in charge, but it starts up all those like, if I did what I, if, if I ever did on a job, what's happening here, I would get fired. So <laughs> um, oh, you're doing a great job. Oh, well, but I want to be able to put up like a picture of me and William in the beginning and then drop me out and have it be William and then have William go to the top and it'd be his presentation and have everybody muted and be able to switch the video towards what's appropriate. And I will figure it out. But the problem is like last week I tried something, you know, I haven't set up a meeting to do it. And I think that's a good idea for next week. Um, I haven't set up a meeting last week. I pinned Bru uh, Dr. Hetzler and uh, we didn't see me. Not that that's important. We didn't see anybody who attended. It was uh, the whole time I introduced uh, Dr. Hetzler, he was full screen. I mean, it's great for that if you want to make sure, but I need to learn the controls, and that's enough. But you know what, Ralph? Just a thought. We might be due for an open forum, so maybe next week, and you think about how you want to do it, but, you know, just to let people yeah. throw out some topics that are that are important to them, some things that they're struggling with real time. That, right. might, that might create some topics for the future. Yeah, uh, one thing I thought about doing was just, you know, um, I can always talk. I don't know the answer to everything. Uh, I'm not a physical therapist, a doctor, an occupational therapist, but I know a little bit about a lot of things and can generally help. So I thought about that. I thought about not doing anything. I thought about the Zoom uh, controls meeting. And then my friend John Loomis, from who's appeared here several times, and uh, he and Michelle have Stroke Sweat Squad, suggested that my story was important and that I should have somebody interview me. And I said, well, you're volunteering? He said, well, I'd love to, but I'm busy next Tuesday after work. He works until 1030 in the morning, and 
I was asking him if we needed to move it till 1130 or something. And so he said, uh, well, no, actually, I can't do it. And I'm saying, I'm thinking to myself, well, then why did you suggest it? And he said, ask Jenny Golder, but her schedule doesn't allow it. And I thought, well, Dennis, I could ask you. But I think maybe an open forum and some Zoom switching might be in order to um, kind of a meeting where we kind of uh, listen to, uh, I'll answer anything anytime, but where we listen to people's concerns and, and, uh, and issues and maybe build them into future programming. Um, yeah, I think we're due for that type of format. I've just been so happy with the last six or seven presentations that like I haven't, uh, Winnie's over there smiling because we were chatting last night about like, you know, do I put it, you know, do we put out, we keep raising the bar, you know, do we drop it back down for a week? Yeah, I guess. Winnie and I bounced a lot of, almost all of these ideas around uh, when we were chatting last night. So I, I see you smiling over there. Anyway, um, so I guess that's that's the plan. If I I'm going out of town for five days, and if I wasn't, I would I would figure this out and solve it um, by next Tuesday. I mean, I've come up with stuff on Sunday, as you know, a couple of times, Dennis. When you're going, what's up on Tuesday? It's Sunday already. Well, I you know I'm just working it out, but I can't do that on the road, and I've got um, a couple of important places to be and to visit, and um, so. I think we'll just have an open forum. And uh, I think we should let William go to bed or at least drop out if anybody else wants to stick around. Do welcome to Yeah, you. I mean, um, I mean, thanks, thanks for having me, Ralph. I really appreciate you having me on. Um, Somebody suggested that you interview me. And I, I said, well, you, you'd be excellent because actually we've already done it. Um, yeah, we did it. I said, I, I'm not going to make the poor guy get up at one o'clock in the morning two weeks in a row. <laughs> anyway, if people feel that's important, I, I'm happy to do it at some point. I've done it. I, I did it on Stroke TV one time. Yeah, sure. No worries. Um, keep me posted. And you and I did that one. You know, it's out on my YouTube channel. A conversation between William and I where we basically go over all a lot of this stuff. Um. Our first conversation, we didn't record it. We probably should have. I think we we talked for about four hours. Yeah, we talked from, um, I think it was from 7 o'clock your time till, um, till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, um, which is basically my 9 o'clock at night to 2 o'clock in the morning, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I, I guess right. I wasn't but, really aware of the time. I mean, I was aware of the time difference. I wasn't aware of that. I was doing that to you, or I probably wouldn't. Yeah, have. no, no, it's all we right. Got caught it, we got caught up in it. You can't talk yeah. for four hours unless you're caught up in it. And, all right, I better head off to bed. Um, yeah, but thanks. Please, but thanks please. again for having me. Uh, keep me posted. Uh, in the interview. Now, I'm going to okay, get sorry. this up before I leave. So my the, my rest of my day is to get this up on YouTube before I leave because I'm just not going to deal with much other than if we got any spammers or anything in the group. Yeah. Anybody goes right crazy, I'll deal with that. But other than that, I, I'm away from my computers and editing gear. and Yeah, stuff. great. So I'll, All right. I'll have, a, have a good rest rest of the day. Uh, All right. Uh, you too. Have a good yeah. sleep and a good Wednesday. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thank you.